My name is Elizabeth Reves, R-E-V-E-S-Z. I'm a breast surgeon at uh, the Women's Center in Hawaii. I work at Pomerado Hospital. Okay, so you know a little bit about the big headline today that Angelina Jolie's aunt just died of breast cancer. And her husband put out a statement saying that he thinks that she would have been alive if she did what Angelina Jolie did and got a double mastectomy before she was even diagnosed with breast cancer. And she would still be alive today. So in a similar situation like It's very likely. Testing for BRCA mutation leads to a lot of mastectomies, which actually decreases the chances of developing breast cancer. Therefore, I believe that survival is very much possible long term doing these double mastectomies. So, if she got a double mastectomy after she was diagnosed with breast cancer, would that change the likelihood of her survival? It's possible. However, I don't know at what stage she was diagnosed at the beginning, therefore I can't comment on that. We usually like to diagnose people before they actually develop the breast cancer, therefore treat them prophylactically with double mastectomies before that. It's a lot more difficult to treat people that have the cancer than prevent the cancer. Well said. And then is Well, let's put it in a different way. Um, with a BRCA mutation, a lot of people have a very high risk of breast cancer, that meaning about 85%. With double mastectomies, that percentage decreases to approximately 5 to 8 to 10%, somewhere in that range. You, it's never going down to zero because we always leave some breast tissue behind that we are unable to see at the time of surgery. Therefore, the, the risk is still there but it's a lot less than 85%. Good, and so with Angelina, her mom died of ovarian cancer, her aunt died of breast cancer, so she had to have a I think if people have a family history of breast cancer in general, uh, of ovarian cancer, cancers in general, I think they need to bring it up to the, their primary care physicians, to their physicians that they're seeing, because it's not necessarily just breast and ovarian cancer that leads to other types of cancer. We have a genetic counselor that can tell you that there's many other different kinds of cancer that are related to breast cancer or ovarian cancer. So I think it's very important to discuss it first of all with your families, find out who has cancer and bring it to your physician. They, at that time, probably we can discuss it, we can come up with likelihood of having this in the family and genetic mutation, and then we can take steps to prevent it. A lot of people are out there and they're seeing this whole thing happen, and they think, well, I should get a double mastectomy, or I should get tested for this gene. How practical is that? Is that should everybody, what, what should they know? Unfortunately, that's true. Double mastectomies, I think, they are a little bit driven by the media, sorry. But um, when the news goes out there, people are afraid and uh, they do want to prevent it. Therefore, they might jump to the conclusion that bilateral mastectomy is the way to go. That is not necessarily true. Most people have an average risk. Very few people have the genetic mutation. However, it is devastating in those families where there is the genetic mutation because most of the time, these people are very young when they develop these cancers. This is why I think it's very important to know exactly who should be tested and then make the decision to have the bilateral mastectomy or not. Uh, it's a very personal decision. It cannot be held against you if you don't. I wouldn't. But I think the follow-up and keeping an eye on these patients is very important. So the follow-up would be a little bit more diff different than in the average population. Well, if somebody has an average uh, risk of breast cancer, I would not recommend prophylactic mastectomy. I don't think that is necessary. It's a big surgery. It's not something that you voluntarily should expose yourself to. However, if the risk is high, a lot of times that's what we recommend, especially when I'm talking about 80% eyes. And then 
that is somebody would find that out by talking to a genetics well, I think what we like to do is, first of all, I would have patients come into my office and tell me what their ha family history is. If I find their family history pretty high up there, um, I usually recommend that they see a genetic counselor. The genetic counselor will then sit down, take their entire family history, and kind of work out the numbers. What, it, what, are the, what is the likelihood of having a genetic mutation in that family? And then recommend testing or not, or just uh, careful uh, observation. And from there on, we, we move on. Um, however, if testing is recommended, the testing comes back positive, that's when we could sit down and discuss further treatments, prophylactic mastectomy, prophylactic oophorectomy, and other types of treatment, such as actually just follow-ups, which is, of course, a little bit more involved than of the average population. Well, for people that are diagnosed with a bio, the genetic mutation, quite common. Um, very few people hold back and say, no, I want to hold on and wait to see what happens. Um, there are such patients, of course. And a lot of times we do uh, encourage for people to have their children breastfeed. And once they're done doing that, decide on the prophylactic mastectomy. I think waiting is okay, uh, not to wait too long though. Uh, forgive me if this is a silly question, but um, so it's a gene, uh, so it can be passed down. Yes, it can be passed down by both uh, parents, the mother or the father. So a lot of times people do look at the BRCA mutation and say, well, you know, nobody in my mother's family had the breast cancer, therefore I shouldn't be tested. A lot of times it is passed on from, from the father and our genetic counselor will talk more about that. But um, you need to, when you're asking your family about breast cancer in the family, ask both parents. And sometimes ask the aunts and the uncles too because they might know more. Okay, uh, my name is Cheryl, C-H-E-R-Y-L, Cina, C-I-N-A. And I'm a genetic counselor at the G. McLaughlin Women's Center at Colorado Hospital. Okay, so we were talking about Mm -hmm. Tell us what they are and what it means for someone when you have that mutation. Mm -hmm. So the BRCA genes are genes that we all have in our bodies. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, some people have a change or what we call a mutation in these genes that increases the risk uh, primarily for breast and ovarian cancer greatly over what the average person's risk would be. What's the difference? Uh, for BRCA1 and BRCA2, uh, again, both essentially they uh, increase the risk for breast and ovarian cancer. We are finding out that there's differences um, between the two, um, mainly cancer risk. So for BRCA2, for example, in some families, there's also an increased risk for pancreatic cancer and for melanoma. Um, we're finding out that um, the types of breast cancer that we see with these genes are different. Um, there's a specific type called triple negative breast cancer that we might see more with the BRCA1 gene. And then finding out different modifiers, um, hormones interact differently, for example, with the risk for both of those genes. So we're finding out more uh, as we go along. So yeah. everybody has these genes, right? Right. So when you have breast cancer or ovarian cancer, you have a mutation or a fault yeah, and not everybody with breast or ovarian cancer has these gene mutations. It's actually only a very small percentage that do. Only about 5 to 10% of women with breast or ovarian cancer will have these gene mutations that have caused their cancer. And if you do have this gene mutation, mm -hmm. do you suggest that they go out and get a double mastectomy or get their ovary mm -hmm. Yeah, for women that have these gene mutations, we sit down and we talk about the different options. So that includes uh, increased surveillance, maybe adding MRIs in addition to their mammograms, for example. Um, but we also talk about the option of preventative surgery. Um, so we just sort of sit down and, and lay out everything and weigh and balance uh, you know, what they want to do and what would be best for them. We don't suggest that everybody does genetic testing. The first step is to talk you know, with your family about the family history, what types of cancer, talk with your doctors um, about uh, whether they're recommending that um, they see a gen if they see a genetics professional. And then the next step would be to actually have genetic counseling. So sit down and talk with a genetic counselor about their personal and family history and their risk factors 
to see if genetic testing is appropriate for them. And really, it's not appropriate for all people. It's just a small percentage of people that have a significant family history or personal history of cancer. And then what goes into this test? How easy is it to The test itself is fairly easy to do. Um, we either take a blood or a saliva sample, and we send it to a laboratory um, for the genes to be analyzed. Oh, OK, but yeah. it does cost a lot of money. Right. The testing itself can be up to um, $4,000. However, if people meet certain criteria based on their personal or family history, most or all of the testing can be covered by their insurance company. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Okay. But not a lot of people qualify, so not a lot of people have to worry about that. Right. And it's, and it's not a test that's appropriate for everybody. You know, sometimes we just end up sitting down with a person and saying, your risk for cancer may be higher but it's not enough to actually have the genetic testing. And so then we talk about, based on their risk, what screenings they should have um, and you know, whatever is appropriate for them. But the testing may not be the best option for them. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody wants more information about genetic counseling or genetic testing, they can contact us at the G. McLaughlin Women's Center um, at Palmerado Hospital. Okay. Have you seen a rate rise in the number of people who may be able to contact you about Yes, yeah, yeah, we have seen uh, that people are more interested in the genetic testing, and so, you know, we're, um, we're glad to answer any questions and um, glad that, you know, people's awareness is being raised um, about this, yeah. Uh, does this facility have anything uh, special or particular to this, to this issue? Uh, yes, exactly, right. So I provide the genetic counseling and can do the genetic testing for anybody that's interested based on their personal or family history of cancer. We actually have uh, come up with a special price for people that are not covered, and we do have a discounted price for that. Oh, for the counseling For the counseling right. portion. Right. Because right. that's the first step, right? Exactly. Correct. Okay. And even people that don't have insurance, the laboratory can sometimes make accommodations to um, help pay in part or in full for their testing. Mm -hmm. So um, just because someone doesn't have insurance, they shouldn't be afraid that they cannot get it. A lot of times we do, we do have nurse navigators at our clinic who actually were looking to finding other ways of financing anything that is related to breast cancer.